Okay, students. So today we're going to uh, continue our discussion uh, where we left off in lecture one um, on some basics of electromagnetics, electrodynamics. And uh, so in electromagnetics, we in lecture one we covered uh, several different um, aspects of basically introduction introductory introduction introductory electromagnetics um, things you may already know but uh, we did so to uh, strengthen your fundamental knowledge or um, uh, fundamental knowledge of electrodynamics but also cast it in uh, a way such that it's amenable to analyzing metamaterials uh, later in this lecture that we're going to be giving and of course throughout the rest of the semester. So today we continue that by looking at another uh, very basic aspect of uh, electrodynamics um, but something that leads to an extraordinary thing in that materials. Uh, that introductory thing is uh, but very extraordinarily important are boundary conditions or is boundary conditions. Um, and so application of these boundary conditions uh, leads to the concept of negative index of refraction in metamaterials. So really interesting thing. And this was one of the most extraordinary predictions of Vizlago back uh, when he first wrote his paper. Um, and it has been experimentally demonstrated, and is, but it still is uh, sort of mind-boggling. So let's get into this. So the analysis that we're going to do, by the way, uh, does not at first um, assume anything in regards to the sign of epsilon and mu. So first we're going to do it uh, just the typical way uh, as seen in any, any electromagnetics textbook, all right? Uh, where it would seem like you would be able to put in any epsilon and any mu, both either positive or negative, and so forth. Um, and we'll revisit that 75% of the way through this lecture and uh, see that when we switch to a lead material with epsilon and mu both being negative, we have to make um, really only one change. Um, well, sort of two changes. Uh, but those two changes uh, will counteract each other such that the same analysis the same calculations for the reflection transmission coefficients, namely for null coefficients. And uh, the result for um, what we get for materials impedance uh, remains totally unchanged with many materials. For the most part, with one uh, proviso, with one exception, and that is this negative index of refraction, where the light is going to be refracted on the wrong side of, of the normal that defines the interface. So, um, and we'll see, this will become clear as we go through this lecture. So, boundary conditions, boundary conditions, and med materials, um, their negative index of refraction. So, how are we doing on, yep, good. So, uh, let us look at what happens when a beam, let's look at what happens uh, when a beam within a normal material, meaning a regular material with epsilon and mu both being positive is incident upon a metamaterial. Uh, it is sufficient to analyze TE and TM polarization separately since there is no polarization conversion uh, with reflection off a of flat and homogeneous material. All right, so, so let's just look at these two polarizations uh, separately, TE polarization and uh, TM polarization. Oh, I have these flipped actually. Uh, this is supposed to be TM polarization. Um, so that's fine. Make, we'll make that note. So like uh, epsilon uh, material 1 is normal, material 2 is normal. We don't make any assumption right now about what epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are. Um, okay. So with this, um, we have it such that uh, we see that we kind of do because in the last lecture we, we had demonstrated that K uh, is in the opposite direction of energy flow in a metamaterial. All right, 
So here, in this situation right here, we see we certainly have energy being delivered by the incident beam, being delivered to this interface by the incident beam. Now, some of the energy is uh, taken away uh, by uh, via reflection, and that uh, that direction of energy flow is associated is going upwards and to the right. And you'll see that I have k r in that direction as well. So both s, the pointing vector, and k r are in uh, upwards and to the right direction. All right. So that's what you would expect for a normal material. And, and you notice that this has to be a normal material too, because energy is being delivered this way, this way. All right. There is no in this situation energy being delivered from the bottom to the interface, and the interface is along the x-axis. So energy must be flowing downwards, all right? That's the only direction in which we provide energy to the system, going downwards, all right? So energy must be going net downwards, all right? And, uh, and so in a, and we have k in some sort of downward direction as well. So that would mean certainly that K and S are not going in the opposite direction as they would be in a metamaterial, with a material with both epsilon and mu being negative. So uh, K and S more than likely are in the same direction, and they are, so that this certainly, uh, as we can deduce, that it is a normal material, namely a material with both epsilon and mu being positive. Okay, fine. So later on, we will adjust this uh, picture so that it is clear that we're dealing with a material for material two that is a metamaterial. But let's go with this right now. Um, all right, so the standard thing for TM polarization that uh, you write down, you break it down into the, um, into the electric field components and the magnetic field components in the different directions. So E and uh, so E and um, material one in the x direction. So E of x in the x direction uh, is the result of two different and two separate waves: the incident wave and the reflected wave. All right, and we see that uh, we need a negative in there. E of y also is due to components of the incident and reflected uh, beams. So a combination of those. Um, and so, but in material two, you only have one beam, the transmitted beam. So E of X is given by this, and E of Y is given by this. Make special note of the negatives and positives right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, and right here. And uh, we have, and so these represent downward propagating beams when you have a positive, and upward propagating beams when you have a negative. All right. And uh, the magnetic field is also, you can write it in this way as well, but it only has one component, the Z component, for the TM polarization. So really this should be TM, TM. All right, and then you can break up Ks into their X and Y components, all right? And, uh, and so this is what you have. Um, Kx uh, here is positive. And so it's the, you were taking uh, square root of mu over epsilon relative, k naught sine. Ky is that same times cosine. And uh, k2x is uh, similarly, but with mu being mu2 and epsilon being epsilon2. So uh, let us go through the normal calculation so that we can clearly see the effects of having epsilon and mu both positive. And once we know that, we, we will have a roadmap to figure out what happens when they're both negative. So we use our the tools at our disposal. Uh, the best tools are going back to Maxwell's equations. So we want to find a relationship, and we want to get rid of some of these undetermined coefficients. So we're going to let our beam have a unit amplitude coming in. So a unit amplitude for HIZ. So we're going to let that be equal to 1. And then we're going to try to figure out once that's equal to one, and once we know and we uh, we know what our incident uh, theta i is, what's everything else? What's uh, h of r? What's e of r? What's e of uh, what's e of i? What's e of t? Which is what's h of t? What is um, 
uh, theta theta sub t. Those are t's. To double check. So so uh, Maxwell's equations provide those relations because we can find out what e x is and e y in terms of h sub z. Do those calculations and see that e x must uh, also be equal to this, and uh, and so thus we can uh, find out what uh, e of i is and e of r in the x direction, um, and uh, e of t. Uh, in the x direction as well. Um, so once we know those now, we, we basically have gotten rid of then uh, this undetermined coefficient, that undetermined coefficient, that one, that, or we've expressed these in terms of a smaller set of unknowns. Um, we've expressed e of i x and e of r x in terms of h of r z and h of i z, which again we're going to let equal to 1, and so forth. So now we invoke the boundary conditions. Um, our tangential electric field is e of x, so write it y is equal to 0, those must be equal. In order for them to be equal everywhere on the interface, we immediately see that k1x must be equal to k2x. Otherwise, we may be able to solve for continuity of e of x somewhere, um, at y is equal to 0 at some x value, but it wouldn't be equal at all x values unless k1x equals k2x. So th that's a piece of information that you can um, use right off the bat, I mean, right before even you do this. So we then uh, use this equation. We, uh, we note that k2x k2x right here is equal to k1x, so e to the i k minus k1x falls out. We're looking at y is equal to 0, and so and then we have a common factor of omega, and again we're setting h of i z is equal to 1, and, uh, and so we get uh, this equation right here. Okay, Our tangential magnetic uh, field continuity equation uh, is this. Um, and that, if you plug that into, you, if you use where, um, if you use these equations right here with h of i being 1, uh, you get this equation right here. And then we have a third equation, boundary condition d of y at y is equal to 0, uh, must be equal to the electric displacement or uh, electric flux density. And so that's epsilon e of y. So we have epsilon e of y right here for 1, and epsilon e of y, or e, e y 1 right here. So we're going to have to multiply this by epsilon 1. And so the epsilons on the denominator will cancel out. And here we have a, a e of y from material 2. We multiply by epsilon 2. That causes the epsilon there to cancel out. We have a common factor of omega. Um, and, what we, and then we get these k1s on both sides here is equal to um, uh, k1x plus k1x hr is equal to k2x htz when k2x right here is equal to k1x that um, cancels and we get that um, 1 plus hrz is equal to htz which is the exact same equation we have right right here all right so um, right here so anyways, um, uh, this provides no new information, all right? We also have the wave equation, um, and uh, we have this wave equation, and where my, we find that k squared is equal to kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared is equal to mu epsilon uh, omega squared. So uh, we generally write that k is equal to n, uh, omega over C, all right, where n is equal to uh, plus or minus square root of mu over epsilon naught. I mean mu times epsilon, mu times epsilon. So both roots will work so far uh, with this um, because this is going to be n squared and both uh, plus and minus, uh, when you square that, will yield a plus right there, and all is good. But normally we take the positive root, um, and uh, 
and but later on we'll see that uh, we're going to be forced to take the negative root for metamaterials. And the Zago realized this, and it was quite an insight. Okay. So k, here are a couple of definitions. k is equal to n omega over c, which is also n. I like to express it quite often in this way. n 2 pi over lambda naught, where lambda naught is the free space wavelength in vacuum. All right, um, so first, a couple of ways of going through this, you can, uh, but why don't we take, find the reflection coefficients first. So we have a couple of equations to work with. We have this equation and this equation. Let's go ahead and uh, eliminate HTZ with this and plug that into here. And doing so, we can solve for HRZ which when my hiz, my incident amplitude, is 1, this is simply the reflection coefficient. And these are all Tm polarizations right here. Uh, so these are all Tm polarizations. And um, this is what you get. All right. When you plug in uh, what Ky, K1y, K2y are, uh, along with the definition of impedance um, as z is equal to square root of mu over epsilon, you see you can express this equation right here as this. All right, and that's my reflection coefficient for the Tm, for the Tm. And when you use this equation, once you have that, um, you can use uh, this right here then to get what uh, the tra transmission coefficient is for the TM, and it's simply this right here. Okay. So, so far so good. So far so good. These are expected results. Um, but the thing to keep in mind at this point is to say, okay, how would this change for a metamaterial? And then you say, well, right now all we know is that this right here would seem to be fine with changing the signs of both mu and epsilon to have them both negative because a negative on top negative on the bottom uh, those would cancel out and so if you had uh, impedance of of, uh, of a certain material and you just took those same mu's and epsilons and, and uh, made them exactly the same magnitude but opposite signs you would not change the impedance value but you don't quite know how to deal with the theta t at this point. What happens with that? All right. So, but so we keep that. Uh, we're going to work with that later. We do note that we've used this equation coming from continuity of h of z, and this equation coming from continuity of e of x to derive these two equations. All right, so those two boundary conditions uh, yielded these equations. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to look at what happens when we do indeed uh, switch um, switch epsilons and mu's to make them uh, both negative. Uh, and so under normal refraction, um, this is what you have right here. This, this is what you have. So you have, I think hopefully, my, I, I seem to recall my pointer shows up when I'm, I'm doing this. Um, that a beam is coming in with both k and the pointing vector s in the same direction. And, uh, and then you can decompose that into its kx and ky components. So this is kx. And you have a reflected beam, but that's, let's not worry about the reflected beam for the moment. That's why I do a dotted line. Um, and, but then the transmitted beam uh, down into material B, for a normal material, you again have k and s in the same direction. And you can decompose k into its x component, which I write down explicitly, and a y component, which I don't write down. But we see here that with theta i uh, going from the normal uh, to the incident beam on the left side of the normal, and theta t being the angle between n and the uh, refracted beam on the right side of the normal, we can get 
k of x two and k two of x and k one of x possibly being equal to each other because they both are pointing in the positive x direction. All right, so it's possible uh, that that we can develop boundary conditions with the rays going in th these general directions. Uh, such that we can have k1x being equal to k2x. All right. But now with the negative index of refraction material, we learned that s uh, is in the opposite direction of k. So with energy being delivered downwards to this overall system, energy must be always going downwards, um, in material 2 at least. And so let's first try where we just simply have uh, the refracted beam still on the right side of the normal, the normal. All right. So k is in this direction, s is in this direction, and so let's decompose k into its x and y components, and we see the x component is negative, meaning it's going in the minus x direction. Whereas for the normal material, k is in the positive x direction. So no matter what you do, you can never get these two things being equal to each other, except for, I guess, normal incidence, um, in which the light beam would go straight down the normal. So this isn't going to work for all angles, uh, this situation. So we see what we can do. Is there another way of doing it? Um, and we see that, okay, let's test out what happens uh, when we have uh, K, when we have light coming in, and you have the other reflected beam, but that's unimportant at this point for this discussion. And we have the reflected beam reflected by the same basic angle, theta, theta t, but on towards the left of the normal. All right? This way instead of this way. So what happened... Are you seeing this? Yeah. Okay. So then what happens is... Uh, okay, fine. Uh, this is all fine. Let's, um, so we're going to try this refraction on the other side of N, where N is, again, this. How does this affect the application of the boundary conditions? Because the one thing you see here is that um, E here, E is still has an X component pointing in that direction, which matches which matches what's going on here, you have an x component in the positive x direction. But for the normal material, you have an E of y pointing upwards, upwards, but down in the meta, this case 2 of the metamaterial, your E of y is pointing downwards. All right, you have E of x and E of y, and uh, E of y, E of x, and your E of y right here is negative. All right, so so that's um, different. Okay, but your E of x is the same, and so this is remember to get these these coefficients right here, reflection and transmission coefficients. We use the boundary condition on E of x and the boundary condition on h of z. Those remained unchanged for theta 2 as theta t defined in this way. All right. So we will get the exact same equations for um, r and t with z's being a z1 and z2. The exact the same but now with theta 2 theta t measured as being positive on this side of the normal. All right. Uh, and we can get the uh, the kx of this is pointing in this direction, all right. So, so this is my kx is in this direction right here. Kx, which it is then possible to have that be equal to the k1x of our incident beam. For some conditions, they're both in the same direction. So now we get rid of that uh, difficulty of having them in opposite directions, and so uh, so this 
certainly is possible. So I, I describe that more. We see that uh, e of x2 and e of z2 are unchanged, but e of y2 changes sign or direction. So that's what I said here. My e of y, e of y right here, changes direction. All right. Okay. But hence the boundary condition for dy is affected, but really is it? Uh, you ask yourself, you say, okay, well, d of y is not just d of y, it's epsilon times d of y. So if this is negative, and this changes sign from positive to negative, then your dy uh, boundary condition remains the same anyways. Um, and so, therefore, if both epsilon and e of y change signs, the dy boundary condition is unaffected. And that's what happens in metamaterials. Both your epsilon and your e of y switch signs, um, but in a way that makes, obviously, dy uh, not switch signs. So that boundary condition is totally unaffected by, by a negative epsilon as long as the refracted wave is on the left side of n. Okay, so that's important. So as long as the re, um, refracted wave, I have refracted on it, is on, yeah, uh, the refracted wave is on the left side of n. Left side of n. Okay, so if we take theta t as the angle between n and the refracted wave and having positive values when it's on the left side of n, um, then we, <clears throat> we must have uh, a negative value for k2x and a negative value for k2y. And so... Uh, so with these being positive, the only way to get negative values here, both for uh, k of x and k of y, is to have the negative root here, and uh, out here. And we lump it together with the square root mu epsilon, the square root of the quantity mu epsilon, such that we call now this whole thing in parentheses the index of refraction n2. All right. Therefore, we get a negative index of refraction. There you go. Amazing. So we get a negative index of refraction to accommodate uh, the fact that in this double negative material, this material with both epsilon and mu being negative, you have to have light reflect, refracted on the left side of the normal if light is coming in from the super straight on the left side of the normal. Okay, so a negative index of refraction. So how does, we get back to now, how does this affect uh, the reflection and transmission coefficients? Well, we've already said before that the boundary condition for A of X and the boundary condition for H of Z uh, are unchanged. Um, and Z, uh, the impedance of material T, do, uh, doesn't matter if both quantities switch signs, quantity uh, mu and epsilon. So negative negative here both of those negatives will cancel out and so if you have the same magnitude of mu and the same magnitude of epsilon uh, but one being a normal material with both of those being positive and and the other uh, meta material with both of those being negative they will act the same because those negatives will cancel out uh, and so so r sub tm and t sub tm are totally unchanged. And the concept of impedance being given by square root of mu over epsilon remains unchanged as well. So we have the impedance of the meta material simply being given by square root of mu over epsilon, relative, relative. Uh, and, and, uh, and the reflection and transmission coefficients for TM polarizations are given by this. So uh, but now the only thing is theta t is positive for the refracted wave being on the left side of the normal that defines the interface. So, uh, really extraordinary. So, so that's really good. Um, now, you can go through the calculations again. Uh, to get what the values should be r and t and... Um, R sub, sub TE, TE, um, where you do the same, same thing. You set up the, uh, 
the waves like this uh, or actually like this for the TE polarization or you can be a little bit more sophisticated about it and use the duality theorem which says uh, to switch between these polarizations all you have to do is let epsilon go to mu and mu go to epsilon which when you do that you see that z has to go to 1 over z and so uh, wherever you have a z1 you get a z2 wherever you have a z2 you have a z1 so you make those substitutions and you get this, these for the Pinel coefficients or the reflection and transmission coefficients all right so we can still use this concept of impedance matching with metamaterials to reflect to reduce reflection so electrical engineers uh, love to do things like impedance um, matching. So a common question you get from folks, from engineers that don't know uh, uh, much about metamaterials is that they say, well, do you still have the same formulas uh, for reflection transmission coefficients uh, when, you have, when you have light being incident on a metamaterial? And the, now you can definitively say, yes, uh, we certainly do. Uh, so you can still get light in a metamaterial just as uh, in a very similar way as you get it and get light within a regular material with a couple of important caveats or qualifications and that is um, number one you have this negative index of refraction and what that represents is the fact that light refracts within the material on in or on the seemingly wrong side of the normal or the opposite side of the normal the normal than typical uh, the, and by typical I mean what's encountered with the, with a regular dielectric material a material with both epsilon and mu being positive so you still have the same equations for reflection and transmission but this theta t measures the angle uh, from the normal to the left um, between your normal and your refracted beam but now your refracted beam is uh, on the opposite side of the normal than typical okay so we can still use the concept of impedance matching to reduce reflection okay so that's that uh, a couple of uh, very important things that have come out of this is um, the fact that Boundary conditions uh, still allow for light to get into a metamaterial, but it's refracted in an interesting way. Um, two, the concept of impedance uh, is the same with the metamaterial being given by square root of mu over epsilon. Um, and that uh, combined with the results from lecture one, where K and S the wave vector and the pointing vector are in opposite directions. So far we have uh, those as being uh, both similarities between normal and regular materials, the same equation for reflection R and T, for example, and key differences between a normal and metamaterial, meaning opposite directions for S and K, um, negative index of refraction, which represents the fact that light uh, refracts uh, on the opposite side of the normal than typical. All right, that's just the first of a handful of key differences. And probably the next lecture will get to another key aspect, another key difference um, between normal and materials, epsilon mu, both positive, and metamaterials. That key thing is the fact that metamaterials can regenerate um, evanescent waves another extraordinary uh, property of metamaterials this can um, reconstitute uh, evanescently decayed waves all right very good everyone um, so that was a mm, I guess a bit of a shorter lecture but one and and seemingly not so difficult either uh, but it uncovers some key fundamental things of metamaterials and uh, it clearly shows you how some things have changed dramatically and how some things have not changed, all right? Um, very important aspects in the education 
in your education what metamaterials are. Okay, take care, everybody. Um, I think at this point I'll be able to drum up, uh, think up some good homework assignments. All right, take care.